All right, we're going to talk about practice problems as a way to learn some fundamental programming skills in R. And I, I got this idea from this website we're looking at called Project Euler, Euler, uh, however you say his name, .net. And I thought this was a really interesting way to learn uh, basic programming skills. For example, if you go here, you go to the archives, what you're going to see is a list of problems. Um, for example, this first problem, multiples of 3 and 5. So they're saying, if we list all the natural numbers below 10 that are multiples of 3 or 5, we got 3, 5, 6, and 9. The sum of these multiples is 23. Find the sum of all the multiples of 3 or 5 below 1,000. Seems like a pretty boring problem. I'm actually not going to go over this problem at all. But what, what you have going on here is that if you solve this problem with code, you can input your answer. If you get the correct answer, you flip over to the forum side of this website, and you can see everyone else's code. And it's a really neat way to, to learn how to code because you're presented with a tangible problem from the outset, and you kind of have to work on your own, figuring out how to solve the problem in the coding language of your choice. And once you actually accomplish that goal, you have acquired some knowledge and some practice that uh, I think is very useful. And uh, you kind of using examples uh, put into practice your knowledge of things like variables, loops, logic, writing functions, writing algorithms. And you also get to see how other people do it at the end of the day. Now, in an older version of some of the content I've developed in various incarnations of courses like this, I've taken this approach. And in this book, uh, in chapter three, we have programming challenges. If you scroll down a bit, there's a bunch of problems from easier problems all the way to harder problems. And uh, generally what I do is have students start uh, on problem number one right here and go through these problems as a way of learning some basic skills in R. And we don't have as much time in this course. So in a series of videos, what I'm going to do is work through some of these problems, uh, sort of live code these problems, and I will share my answers. And I think it's potentially the case that uh, listening to someone talk about the thought process, the problem solving process that goes into solving practice problems uh, could be a useful way to learn about basic programming skills. Uh, well, let's see how it goes. Like I said, we're gonna try lots of different angles. So we can try some more formal lectures, we can try some live coding, and we can take requests on ways to present content. Anyways, in the practice problem series, we're gonna be going through these. So let's start with the first one. Do simple math with numbers, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Great, we can do that. Uh, actually, I'm just going to copy the first four. Well, first of all, I'm going to set up a thing to work in. And this is something you're going to be doing a lot of in this course. So we're in a project, Programming Basics. We just finished this mean example. Let's get rid of that. I'm going to make a new R markdown. I'm going to call this Practice Problems. All right, here we go, practice problems. Great, I'm gonna delete all this stuff, save it, call this practice underscore problems, press save, and we're ready to go. Just for fun, I'm gonna copy in one to four and kind of label them a bit. One, two, I'm just setting up Three, four. I'm setting up some space. And uh, this is another great reason for using R Markdown. You can kind of lay out some things you want to try working on. So I want to try working on this first thing. And I um, need to write some code for it. So I made an R code chunk. And I just want to demonstrate for myself that I can do some simple math. So can I do addition? So I can take a number and do 23 plus 5 and then get 28. Yep. I, I notice I've got some leftover stuff in my global environment. I just want to clear that out so I know I'm good to start. 
that empty. So I'm going to knit this and I'm going to start making a notebook where for each of these little problems, I'm going to have some example code that provides solutions to the problem. And I can, uh, you know, if I make this, then I can kind of consult to, to it later when I know that I have working code that I can come back to. So let's do some addition. Let's do some subtraction. Let's do some multiplication, some division. Cool. How about some long stuff like one plus three, maybe parentheses around that to make sure it all happens together, divided by five. So we're good. All right. I think I'm pretty comfortable with basic math here. We could do exponentials, so two to the power of two is four. Um, is there any other weird stuff? I'm just going to leave that there and let's move on to number two, putting numbers into variables and do simple math on the variables. All right, let's try that. We're gonna create a variable A, I'm gonna put a number in it, a variable B, put a number in it, a variable C, put a number in it. Now I'm gonna do A plus B plus C, oops. There we go. And I've just demonstrated that I can do some simple math here on these variables. Let's do A plus B, C plus B. I think I got the hang of that here. So I've simply put some numbers into these variables and then I can, you know, well, C times B, how about that slightly different? Make a big number. Great. I feel confident that I could proceed this way. I wonder about a few other things though. Let's, let's see some things, just try them out. For example, what if we had uh, a vector that was three ones. And what if we had a B vector that was the numbers one, two, and three. What if we add these together? Can we do that? Yes, we can. We get a two, so one plus one is two, a three, one plus two is three, and a four. All right, there's some minimal examples. Let's get into three. Write some code that will place the numbers one to 100 separately into a variable using a for loop, and then again using the sequence function all right, I'm just going to interpret this generally as let's make the numbers 1 to 100. Let's talk about some ways you could do that. Well, here's one way. We get the numbers 1 to 100 just like that. We don't need to do any of these other things. It's a fast way to do it. I'm going to comment this out just so that we can keep doing. We're going to do it a bunch of ways. And every time we knit, we can kind of see what's going on where we're seeing our questions. We are seeing our answers and we're down here. One nice process ab about this whole R markdown situation is uh, we know that if we make an error right now, uh, uh, the knit process won't compile the whole document. So when it knits, we're actually giving ourselves a little test and we're verifying that our code is working, which is a, a it's kind of cool to be able to know that if I knit successfully, it means that my code's working pretty well. Okay, actually I need to go back to this first example here because I didn't actually put these numbers into a variable, I just printed them. So let's put them into the variable A. Press play, and now we go to the environment tab, we can see we've got an A. It's got the numbers one to 100 in it. We print it out, we can see it just like that. So that's one way to do it. Let's do it another way. Let's use the seek function. So what is this? If, if you ever see a name of a function, 
you can always look it up by going question mark, name of the function, resting return. And let's look at this. Sequence generation. This is one of the first times in a video where I've started looking at the help files. I remember first learning R and being like, oh, these help files are so hard to read. So I probably think that they're hard to read if you're not familiar with them. Let's check it out. This is supposed to explain how you use the seek function. And, you know, it's kind of a lot to look at, even though this function is actually pretty straightforward. Um, from equals one, let's pop that in here. From equals one, comma, two equals one. Well, let's try to interpret this. From and two are the starting and end values of the sequence. So from one to 100. And by is the number to increment in terms of the sequence. So we go by equals one. And let's confirm what happens when we run this line of code. Copy, paste, press return, and it works. It goes from one to 100. So if we did all of this and assigned it into A, we would get uh, a 1 to 100 there. At this point, I want to mention uh, something about the syntax of writing inputs inside of our functions. So we've got the name of the function, then a parentheses on both sides, and then inside we're putting our inputs from, to, by. Let me show you another way we can write this. It's a faster way. Oops, copy, paste. So I know the first three, thi I know the first thing is from, so I can do one. I know the second thing is two, so I can do 100. I know the third thing is by, and I can do a one again. This is a short form because I, I don't need to write the words um, and it still works. It's also worth noting that you don't need to write the words in order. So if we said two equals 100, from equals one and by equals one, this will also work. However, if you do it without the words, you have to put them in the default order. And even though this wasn't, wasn't the, uh, the solution to this question, which has to do with the numbers one to 100, um, we can use the seek function to produce all sorts of sequences. I'm just gonna go back up to this one here. So we're gonna go from one to 100 in steps of two or in steps of three or in steps of four, steps of five. So the seek function can be very useful to generate uh, sequences of numbers. Okay, so we've seen four ways to generate the numbers one to 100. How many other ways are there? Well, it's asking us to use a loop to do this. So how would we do that? Let's make a for loop. And um, this is actually going to be kind of silly, but we're going to say for i in the numbers 1 to 100, let's create a variable. Let's work with b in this case. And we're going to put uh, nothing into this variable. We're going to start it out as an empty variable using the combined statement. So it starts out empty. And then for each iteration of the loop, we're going to tack on a new value, and it will be the value of i in the iteration. Um, I might use this to illustrate a loop again. 
but let's see, see if we can write it out here. Uh, we know that I, if we were to print this, we're going to run this bit. So we're printing out the value of I on each step of the loop. We're not putting this into a variable. What is B? It's currently nothing. So we want to, for each step of the loop, instead of printing the I to the console here, we want to put it into the next slot of B. So we're going to be assigning new parts to B. So we can assign something into B. Now what do we want to assign into B? This is a kind of weird one. We use the combine function. And we're actually going to combine B with the value of I. Let's see what this looks like if we just put a 1 here, for example. So at each step of this loop, we will be combining the current value of B. We'll append a 1 to it. So in the first step of the loop, the current value of B is null. On the second step, uh, or sorry, let me say this. Before we start rolling here, B is null. At the first step of the loop, i becomes 1. And then we run this command. And we're basically saying this. b is a null. So even though we're saying this, this actually means combine a null with a 1. So that means b will now be uh, a 1. On the next step of the loop, uh, b will be a 1. Um, do I have room here? So when we do, when i equals 2, what we're saying is that, well, b will be a 1 already, and we're going to combine that with another 1. And then so b is basically going to be a 1, 1. So let's check that out. I need to get better at using whiteboards for explaining things. But sometimes there's no substitute for just running some code and seeing what it does. So we did this, and we look at B, and now B has 101s in it. It started off with nothing in it, but when we did this, we put 101s in it. So instead of attaching a 1 every time, let's attach the value of i. So to redo all of this, I'm going to go and highlight all of this code because if I run line 53, I'm going to reset b back to null, and I'm going to go through this loop one more time. And doing it this way, I've used a loop to add to the value of b um, systematically at each iteration. Now there's more than one, one way you can do it with a loop. And let's talk about creating, and it, sorry, it's, it sort of depends how you want to set up your original uh, variable. So start with null. Let's try something else. Um, start with empty vector of 100 zeros. All right, how would we do that? Uh, let's say we want to make a variable. Um, let's call it D. And we want this variable to contain 100 placeholders, almost like just a bunch of slots. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and like make 100 of these, right? How do we set up an empty vector with 100 spots in it? There's more than one way to do this. Here's one way. We could say length. 100. And now we've got D. It's set up to have a length of 100. And what's, what's kind of cool about this is you could go and say, well, um, let's put a number into any position we want. Let, let's put a number into the 50th position of D. And we could put a 5 there if we wanted. So we could do that. Let's take a look at D. Oh, some 
Okay, some oddities here. Uh, but we, so this is a bit weird actually. This thing has a one at the beginning, a bunch of NAs everywhere, and a five at the value of 50, and no other things. Not going up to 100. So, hmm. I could go on about this, I think, but let's, let's start with something that we can hopefully understand, such as creating a variable D with 100 zeros. And an easy way to do that is to use the rep function. This stands for repeating. If we did, if we did question mark rep, it's going to replicate elements, some element x, some number of times. So we want to rep 0 100 times. And if we do that, we've now set up a variable that has 100 elements in it, and they're all zeros. So this is another way to initialize uh, the beginning. If you already know you're going to need 100 of something, you can make it 100 of zeros, or 100 of whatever you want. And then we can go through a process of systematically replacing these values, like going in here and look, let's put a 1 into here. Let's put a 2 into here. Let's put a 3 into here. Let's put a 4 into here. And we can populate this from zero to, or from 1 to 100 this way. And by hand, let's just do this by hand for a second. D at position one, let's make that a one. Okay, did we do it? Yep. D at position two, let's make that a two. So, okay, so now we've got a one and a two. A D at position three, oh. Oh my God, so boring. Can you play music? You can start to see why loops can be useful. When you get into a situation like this, you don't want to go from 1 to 100 by yourself. This can take forever. So how could we do this with a loop? Well, let's say for i in 1 to 100. What I want to do is go into the d variable and at position i, let's assign it the value of i. So what's that going to do? Let's see if I can do a better job of the whiteboard to explain this. And let's think about what i is going to be, what d bracket i is going to be at each step of the loop. So at step one, i becomes a one right and basically we're going to assign position one of d the value of one at the second step of the loop i becomes a two we'll assign the, pos the position two of d the value of two because uh, remember this whole formula here is to go assigning the value of i into this position. So this ought to do it. I can delete this stuff. Run that. And you can see now that we've assigned in uh, the values 1 to 100 uh, using a slightly different method. So we've got this assigning in directly to the position element position of the uh, vector and we've got this other method where we're appending I want to so th let me say that grow the vector um, this method here can be more memory intensive what you're doing um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the previous method here, you start with a vector b that had nothing in it. In the first step of the loop, it grows itself into w a vector of one thing in it. 
the next step of the loop it adds the next step of the loop it adds the next step of the loop it, loop it adds so it gets bigger every step of the loop in this other version that we just did we made a vector that already had a hundred spots in it and they were all zeros so we didn't make this vector bigger at all um, generally predefining variables like this making them the size that they're going to end up being is less memory intensive and growing variables like this especially when things get larger uh, can be uh, much more time consuming all right are there any other ways that we can place the numbers 1 to 100 separately into a variable um, probably but I'm going to yeah I'm gonna do one more what the hell you know we're, we're this the whole point of this is just to sort of sit here and talk about these weird problems we know what the problem is it's put putting the numbers 1 to 100 in something okay So I'm going to do something kind of silly. I'm going to make more work for myself than I need to do. Uh, we'll take this basic example here, copy it, and let's make this. Uh, so making it an E. So we've got an E that starts 100 zeros. And we're going to go for I in 1 to 1,000. What happens if we try to do this? It, it works. So it actually makes an E that has the numbers 1 to 1,000 in it. So go way past 100. What if we didn't want to do that? How do we stop at 100 if this loop's going to go from 1 to 1,000? Well, we could use some of those if statements. We could say if I is less than or equal to 100, I'm going to put this just on that same line, just like this. Then we'll do this. Um, so this will only occur if it is true that i is less than or equal to 100. So with this logical condition in place, if we rerun this, we can now see that e only goes from 1 to 100. And, um, yeah, I mean... As you can see, there's lots of ways to accomplish the same problem. Once you become uh, comfortable, there you'll find out there's lots of tricks in R. Like right, right at the top here, this is just a fast way to do it if you need 100 numbers. Um, but learning a combination of these kind of fast ways, some of the default functions like sequence, and then using basic tools like for loops, uh, if you have all of those things at your disposal, you'll find that R opens up in a very nice way. And when you're confronted with problems that you're not familiar with, you need to sort of think about how to solve them. It's useful to have like a Swiss army knife of uh, tools and approaches to help uh, solve the problems that you have. All right, let's move on. So we're finding the sum of all of the integer numbers from 1 to 100. All right, so we already know how to make, I mean, let's think about solving this problem. Like we need to have the numbers 1 to 100 in the first place, otherwise we can't solve this problem. Above, we learned how to make all of the numbers from 1 to 100. We know we can do it just like this. That's a fast way to make the numbers from 1 to 100. So how do we add up all these numbers? Uh, well, let me show you a trick. You can think about it in your head this way. We're not going to do it in R. But if you line up all the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 100, that's a number line going that way. Um, well, let's, let's go 99, 98. Um, all right, so if we reverse this number line and go 1, 2, 3, all the way to uh, 98, 
99,100. Imagine these two number lines. Um, if we add down, what do we see? It's 101. 99 plus 2 is 101. 98 plus 3 is 101. It's all 101. There's 100 101s, right? And what does that equal? Well, 100 times 101 equals 10,100. So that's the sum of two number lines from 1 to 100. So half of this, divide by 2, equals the sum of one of them. And you could see that that would be 5,050. Right? 10,100 divided by 2 is 5,050. So we know that's the answer. Well, we could simply use the sum function and we get the answer too. So there's a really fast way to sum up all the numbers from 1 to 100 in R and a fast way to check our work so that we know that's the right sum. Um, but uh, I don't think this is super useful in terms of understanding basic stuff in R. So how could we write our own sum function in order to, or let's see, calculate it ourselves? Um, let's talk about the problem. So let's put the numbers 1 to 100 into, to a variable a. So there they are. What we want to do is go through each of these numbers and add them to some kind of variable keeping count of the sum. So I'll create a variable called my sum. Start it off at zero. I'm going to add the first number in, then the second number, and then the third number, and so on. This number will just keep getting bigger. And so we could do this for i in, actually let's do it like this, for i in a. What will happen here? Well, when we do i in a, let's talk about the value of i will be, the value of a will be, on each step of the loop. So first of all, a is the number uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 100. It's got 100 numbers in it. So the first step of the loop, the first, you know, let's just write this out kind of long form. The value in the first location of a is a 1. And so this will basically go into i. So i will be 1. And then when a is a 2, uh, i will be 2, and so on. Right? Let's just verify what's happening to i when we run the loop. And it goes from uh, 1 to 100. What do you think would happen instead of printing i if we printed a every single time? And just pause and, and think about that. Well, what is a? Remember, a is all these numbers. If we printed a every single time, it would print these 100 numbers 100 times. Let's see if that happens. Yep, that's a lot of printing of those numbers. All right, so we should have the idea here that as we go through this loop, um, uh, we're just gonna delete this. As we go, th as we go through this loop, uh, we want to basically add the current value of i to my sum. So we want to say my sum be equals to itself plus i. And so i is going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. My sum, remember it starts out at 0. So the first iteration it's going to be um, 0 plus 1. It's going to equal 1. 
then it's going to be, now it equals one, so the next step it's going to be my sum plus i, so that's gonna be one plus i is two, so that will equal three. And then the value of my sum will be three, so the next step it's gonna be three plus three, and that's gonna equal six. So it's gonna keep adding up. What we can do if we want is just to check it out, we can print my sum and run this whole thing. So let's do that. Yep. So we can see it goes one, three, six, and on and on and on, up to 5,050. All right, so we've taken a more programmatic approach to finding the sum of the numbers from one to 100. Uh, we're going to go a little bit beyond the question, which was just to find the sum of all the integers from 1 to 100. I'm going to knit that just to make sure we're saving all our work. Um, yep. Actually, here, yeah, why, why, why not? I'll just leave it printing everything. That's, that's fine. My question is, could we write a more general function that could find the sum of any numbers in a variable, not just the numbers one to 100. So let's talk about writing that function. We're going to call it my sum, and we're going to write function, left, right parentheses, left, right curly brace. This is our basic setup for the function syntax. Um, I like to start like this. So inside the parentheses are our inputs. And we could, let's be verbose. So I'll use the variable name my numbers to represent the numbers that are going to go into the function. You could just use x. That would be pretty short but we'll use my numbers for now. And inside the function, I'm gonna create a variable called the sum, start it off at zero. I'm gonna say for i in my numbers, the sum is equal to the sum plus i. Run that loop. And at the end, we're going to return the value of the sum. So when we press play, we load that function into the environment. We should see it appear here under the functions list. And let's try it out. We can write my underscore sum, left parentheses, do one to 100. We already know the answer to this should be 5,050. So we could test our function and we could see that it works. What's nice about doing it this way is that you could now use your function um, to do other numbers. So what about the numbers one to 10? You get 55. What about the numbers one to 1,000? You get 500,500. So this is neat because you can uh, write you can use, we can reuse this function for this general purpose anytime you want to use it. And I'll just briefly note, um, there's more, many, many more things to learn about uh, where to put your functions that you've written. Right now, this function is just exists in this R Markdown document. And I want to show you a couple things right now since thinking as we're using a simple function about that could sorry that might trip you up when you're trying to use functions so what I just did was I cleared the workspace and because I did that uh, this function is no longer available if I was to try to reload it I got error could not find the function that's because I cleared the workspace I have to rerun this line or this whole bunch here 
to get the function back in there. And then I can run the function. So I'm going to clear the workspace again. And um, this is, I just want to point out uh, an order of operations here. So we are in the, well, at, at the end of this, our markdown document, we're in the line 100s. And it's at this point in the document where we define this function. If I try to do something like take, take this line and bring it up to the top, and let's say I tried to put it right here and run this function before it was defined, it's not going to let me do that. See, when it gets to line 15, it says, I don't know what this function is. That's because at this point in the document, it hasn't been defined yet. So things go in order from top to bottom in terms of defining these functions. Once the function has been defined by running this piece of code, afterwards we can run these other ones. And we can run them in other code chunks too. So if we created a new code chunk here and we said my sum six to eight, uh, all of those will work and go right to the bottom and see six to eight is working. All right, we are, I don't know how long this has been going on. I don't know, should we go to problem number five? Write a function to find the sum of all integers between any two values. Well, we're probably well poised to solve this problem. Let's see if we can do it. It's gonna be related to this one, which is find the sum of any numbers. Um, let's write a function to find the sum of all integers between any two values. Okay. As you'll notice, I'm just, uh, I'm intuiting that I could probably riff off of this same work that I already did. So I copied this, I'm bringing it down here, and I'm going to add the word range so I'm going to create a new function called my sum range, and I'm going to say I'm going to need a min and a max. The min will be the minimum value, the starting value, and the max will be the ending value. Okay, so what do I need to do here? I, uh, let's think about it. I want to find I want to basically create sequences that start at a number and go to another number and increment by one. We already learned we could do that uh, using like one to five would be like this. Five to nine would be like that. We could do something like min to max. How about that? So let's insert this kind of thing in here. Uh, we want to take our minimum maximum number and then use that to create some numbers. So we've got a variable here called my numbers. Let's use that. And what we can say is min colon max. Now, when we input a minimum value and a maximum value, this will basically take the place those values creating the sequence from the minimum to the maximum value and then we can sum it up and return it. So that should work. Let's test it out. My sum range. Now let's just check ourselves. One, two, three. So we took one to three. We should get a six, right? If we add up one, two, and three. So the min equals one. The max equals three and we get a six looks like it's working and if we did the min equals one and the max equals 100 we get our 50 50 we already know that's the right answer so we've made a modification here and uh, created a function that finds the sum of 
any range of integer values. I'm just going to do an example of making this a little bit easier to read. And I mean, do we need to keep going? We could. How about this? Just to give some more examples, this one won't be particularly interesting. I'm going to call this some range B. So we know there's a second version. And we're just going to, rather than define min and max here like this, we could do it using the seek function, min. So it's from equals min to equals max by equals one. All right, so this, this should work as well. Let's try that. I'm highlighting it all, pressing command return, and it looks like that works too. So in this problem, uh, it was really, we could build off our previous code making the sum function, and uh, we just had to figure out how to make sequences of numbers between a particular starting value and a particular ending value. You know what? Just let's just keep doing this because there's one more thing I want to show you just to get you thinking about it. I'm going to change this to a C. Okay, let's think about what these functions are returning. So both of these return the, the sum of the numbers and that's great. But what if you wanted to inspect the numbers themselves and make sure that they actually w were the sequence that you intended. So right now, all we're getting as our output is the final sum, and we're not actually getting this sequence. So when we do this one, we get the, oops, I have to, so I haven't, I got an error here because I hadn't compiled this version with the C on the end. That means it's not showing up here. But when I do that, I get uh, that appearing in there again. So now I can do this. So what I'm saying is we can run this function. We can see that there's a six. That's the sum of one, two, three. But we can't verify that uh, there was a sequence one, two, three. That is, we're, we're not getting to see the value of this one. Let me show you a quick modification. We're going to use list. And be careful about the parentheses. Let's see what happens when we do this. All right. So when, when we're returning an answer, we're now going to return two things, the sum and the vector of the numbers. And we can actually give this a little bit more information. If we did it like this, uh, we're actually going to give each of these things a name. So let's check that out. I'm just going to highlight it all and run it again. Yeah, so now we've given these things a named list. Um, yeah, so I'm just showing here that we can uh, create functions that do some things inside. In this case, we're doing two major things. We're generating a sequence of numbers, and then we're doing something to it. We're finding the sum. And if we wanted to save all that information, we can combine it all in terms of a list and we could access it later. And this is, uh, yeah, it could be useful for lots of things we want to do later on. Okay, I'm going to go back and look at number six. List all the odd numbers from one to 100. Okay. Let's do it. Let's list all the odd numbers from 1 to 100. Why not? I'm going to keep going. I think I'll, I'll stop after this. The, the one after this is list all the prime numbers from 1 to 1,000. Uh, let's start with listing all the odd numbers from 1 to 100. All right. So we know how to make the numbers 1 to 100, just like this. 
done. But uh, how do we get oh, only the odd ones? We could pull some tricks. We know the seek function. We could go 1 to 100. And if we put a 2 here, we're going to go 1, and then we're going to go up 2. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, and then go up 2, 3, 4, 5. And it's going to give us uh, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, all the way to 99. And these are all the odd numbers between 1 and 100. So you could do it this way. Um, let's think about this problem more programmatically in terms of you have some numbers, let's say 1 to 100, and you want to go look at each of them, evaluate that number, and if it is an odd number, let's print it. All right? And if it isn't an odd number, we won't. So let's start off with the variable. I'm going to put some numbers into it, 1 to 100. There we go. We know we're going to go through each of the numbers. So we're going to use a for loop. We're going to do i in a. And right, remember a is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, on and on to 100. At each step of the loop, i becomes the value 1, then it becomes the value 2, and the value 3, and so on. So what we want to do is, this is the first step, we want to look at this, and we want to ask the question, is this an odd number? And if the answer is yes, then we want to print it. So if we just did this, print i, this wouldn't work because it's just going to print all the numbers. We basically want to do something like this. If i is odd, right, print it. But how do we actually accomplish this part? This is English. This is not code. Too bad. So how do we know if a number is an odd number? Well, you could use what's called the modulus. Let's check out the modulus. It's two uh, percent signs. And how does it work? Let's start with the number 4 mod 2. What do we get? 0. What about 3 mod 2? 1. The modulus is telling us about the remainder. So if you divide a 4 by 2, there's no remainder. If you divide a 3 by 2, there is a remainder. If you divide any odd number by 2, you get a remainder. And that means the modulo will be 1. So let's think about this. When i is 1, what if we just ask the question 1 modulo 2? We'll get a 1. What about when i is 2? It'll be 0. What about when i is a 3? It'll be 1. When i is a 4, it'll be 0. So we're going to set up um, a, a logic question here. We're going to say i modulo 2 equals 1. And this is basically saying whenever we're going to go through each of the numbers and we're going to compute the modulo and then print it if it's 1. Let's try it. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. All right, so that worked pretty well. We could shorten this up. Um, so, like we've seen in a few other examples, we actually don't need the separate line inside the curly braces. We can just put it right here, just like that. All right, I'm going to show you one more way to do it using logical indexing. And this is a very R way to do things. We're going to create a variable with the 
numbers 1 to 100 in it. And now we're going to index into that variable. Like we could normally say, like, oh, what, what are the first 50 numbers? You know, we can do stuff like this. What about numbers where a is less than 50? That'd be another way to do it, except, uh, yeah, here we only go up to 49. So we've inserted inside of here uh, a logic statement where we're comparing uh, all of the values in a and asking them if they're less than 50. Remember, if we look at this particular piece and just type it in, what we actually get is a vector of true and false values lining up with which values in A are actually less than 50. So we can do something like this. A modulo 2 equals 1. And this is going to tell us which of the values in A are actually the odd numbers. So this is a pretty fast way to do it using logical indexing. And uh, so, yeah, again, one more way to do it. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. The next challenge is summing up all of the prime numbers from 1 to 1,000. And yeah, I need to take a break. My my voice is going off. So I'll be back and we'll talk about this problem. See you in a bit.